everyone, it's Katrina. Number 10. Noah's Ark If the biblical story of Noah's Ark is a real thing that happened, where is the Ark today? Most recently, a team of evangelical Christians made the claim that they discovered its remains hidden underneath layers of volcanic debris. They made the discovery in Turkey, in the exact spot where the Bible claims Noah's Ark came to a rest. Archaeologists are dismissing the claims as nonsense. But what if they're wrong? Paul Zemanski, an archaeologist who specializes specializes in the Middle East, said he doesn't know of any expedition that searched for the Ark and ever found it. And yet, according to the group called Noah's Ark Ministries International, the Ark is right there, hidden in plain sight. They admitted that they can't be 100% sure, but they are at least 99.9% .9 positive. The Ark is supposedly buried at a whopping 13,000 feet above sea level near the peak of Mount Ararat in Turkey. It would be one thing to make a guess but the team says they found real physical evidence. They allegedly excavated wooden compartments buried near the top of the mountain in 2007 and 2008. Based on the Bible's description of the gigantic ship, it was partitioned into a lot of different spaces to keep all the various animals. The team believes the wooden structures they found were those very animal cages. However, they haven't shown any proof and have kept the exact location of the discovery a secret. The Book of Genesis suggests the Ark landed somewhere near the ancient kingdom of Urartu, located in what is now Turkey. People have always associated the mountain with the place where the Ark stopped, going back about 3,000 years. But there's never been verifiable proof of a biblical flood in Turkey. Most scholars say even if the Ark was real, the wood would have been used to build houses by Noah and his family. If there were real wooden structures found in the mountain in 2007, most archaeologists say there would be shrines built by early Christians. They could have been to commemorate the spot where they thought Noah's Ark landed. The discovery is still extremely controversial. Until somebody digs a giant boat out of the ground, we are never going to know for sure. What do you think? Do you think we'll ever find Noah's Ark? Let me know in the comments. And now for number 9. But first, it's shout out time! I want to give a big shout out to Simon Rainbow and to Patrick from Holland. Love you guys and thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Number 9. The House of Peter the Bible doesn't go into a lot of detail about Jesus Christ's life as a child. It mostly talks about him as an adult. We don't get to see much about his day-to-day -day life, but there is enough in there to figure out some things. For example, we know he spent most of his adult life in Capernaum. This was a tight-knit community of fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. And it was here, on the edge of that sea, that Jesus Christ started his own ministry at a local synagogue. He recruited several fishermen to be his loyal disciples and thus started his journey to to crucifixion. In the years after the death of Christ, pilgrims traveled to the fishing village of Capernaum. According to their writings, there was once a beautifully preserved ancient synagogue which was believed to be the building where Christ first taught. And while the ruins of this building are long gone, its legend lives on. But there is another important building in the fishing village that scientists have been desperate to find. That would be the House of Peter, Jesus' human stepfather. The Bible suggests Peter Peter's house was in Capernaum. After all, Jesus must have had a home there unless he lived on the streets. Archaeologists believe they may have just found that very house. Italian excavators working in Capernaum uncovered the remnants of a small abode buried underneath the foundation of a Byzantine church. It appears to date back to the 1st century BC. The house looks simple, just like any other house from the early Roman period. It had a few small rooms around a central courtyard and it was totally plain. Except it wasn't. Archaeologists were shocked to see that the house went through an alteration. It started out simply enough, but then was renovated. The main room was completely plastered, something very rare for 2,000 years ago. Plaster was expensive. There was also a change in pottery. Instead of cooking pots and bowls, there were storage jars and oil lamps. Everything points to the residents transforming from a home to a place of community gatherings. This suggests it was Jesus' house which, as an adult, he transformed to organize the first Christian meetings. Unless researchers find the names of Jesus and Peter on some coffee mugs, there isn't any way to prove the theory beyond a reasonable doubt. Still, this does look like the house of Peter, the physical birthplace of Christianity. 
Number 8. The Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III In December 1846, an excavation team conducting an archaeological study at the Mesopotamian ruins of Nimrud found something extraordinary. Sir Austin Henry Layard was the man who uncovered the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. It's currently on display on the ground floor of the British Museum in London. Thousands of years ago, it was erected in one of the greatest Assyrian cities of all time. Even after the last century and a half of archaeological advancements, the Black Obelisk is still considered the only complete Assyrian obelisk ever discovered. The obelisk itself is quite large and impressive. It is a thick and heavy chunk of black limestone built in the year 825 BC. It was placed in the central courtyard inside the Assyrian capital. Its top was made to look like a ziggurat, the Mesopotamian version of a pyramid. But it's not the obelisk itself that's so exciting, but rather the inscription written on it in the ancient Akkadian language. The monument was made to commemorate 31 years of successful military military campaigns overseen by Shalmaneser III. He ruled Assyria between 858 and 824 BC. The obelisk is decorated in scenes that match those inscriptions. There are a total of five narrative scenes describing the king's triumph over the kings of other nations. One of those inscriptions describes how Shalmaneser III triumphed over Jehu of the House of Omri, king of Israel. The image that comes with the inscription shows King Jehu offering a huge tribute of gold gold, silver, tin, and the staff of the king's hand. This was meant to be humiliating for the Israelites, showing them in such a pitiful state, having to pay for their safety. If you're wondering what this has to do with the Bible, it was a big deal when it was first discovered. The obelisk was one of the first pieces of archaeological evidence that biblical figures were real people, even the obscure ones. This shows that Jehu of the House of Omri wasn't just a character in a story, but a real person, and this substantiated the Bible in a way that had never been done before. Number 7. The Quest for the Holy Grail the Holy Grail was the vessel that Jesus Christ drank from during the Last Supper. That final and fateful meal, when he sat around the table with his disciples, he sipped from a jewel-encrusted goblet. This same goblet was then used to collect his blood after he was stabbed in the side with a spear. It is the literal Holy Grail of Holy Grails. But there is no historical account of what happened to it after the Bible. According to medieval history expert Margarita Torres, it's currently inside the Basilica of San Isidoro in León, Spain. Margarita says she and another historian named José Miguel Ortega del Río came to their conclusion after three years of investigation. They believe the Holy Grail is the goblet known as the Infanta Doña Urraca. This bedazzled piece of glassware was named in honor of King Ferdinand I's daughter, who lived in the 11th century. So how in the world did the researchers come to such a conclusion? They were looking through the Islamic remains in the basilica when they found some mis mysterious Egyptian parchment. These parchments spoke of a valuable holy chalice that was taken from Jerusalem back to Cairo. The chalice was then given to an emir ruling over one of the Islamic kingdoms of Spain. The chalice was then gifted to King Ferdinand, who gave it the name of his daughter. For the past 900 years, it hasn't left the basilica. It's been open to public viewing in the basement since the 1950s. The relic is made from gold and onyx and dusted with precious stones. Scientific dating has put the creation of the cup somewhere in the first century. That coincides exactly with when it would have been used by Christ at the Last Supper. The date matches, there are historical records to back it up, but is it really the Holy Grail? What do you think? Let me know in the comments! Number 6. The Magdalene Synagogue Researchers conducting excavations on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee recently unearthed a new synagogue in Migdal. The synagogue is 2,000 years old, situated in the ruins of the town where Mary Magdalene was supposedly born. It's the second synagogue of its kind discovered in the ruins and could help shed some light on the religious lives of Jews in the area before the rise of Jesus. Excavation co-director Dina Avshalom Gorni 
from the University of Haifa said she can imagine Mary Magdalene and her family going to the local synagogue to participate in communal events. Before Mary got in touch with Jesus, she was likely a Jew like everyone else in the town. But then she met Jesus, and that's where things get confusing and controversial. Some say Mary Magdalene was nothing but a prostitute who played a negligible role in the life of Jesus. But there are religious texts out there that suggest Mary Magdalene was much more. For example, the Gospel of Mary, discovered in Egypt as part of the Nag Hammadi collection in the 1940s. This ancient text suggests Jesus and Mary were married, not just romantically involved, but fully married. That would make Mary Magdalene a significantly important person in the life of Jesus Christ, though of course, the church has denied it. Whatever role Mary played in Jesus' later life, she started her life in the small Jewish settlement of Migdal. This newly discovered synagogue is now the first time two such structures have been unearthed from the Second Temple period in the same town. It was built from volcanic basalt and limestone, consisting of a main hall and two smaller rooms. One of the rooms was for storing Torah scrolls, and the other may have been for purification rituals. It's not for certain that Mary attended the synagogue, but it is highly likely. Both of the known synagogues in Migdal existed until the Jewish rebellion of 67 AD. That was when the Roman Empire really put their foot down on Israel and its people. And now for number five. But before that, I wanted to give a big thank you to Neko's Corner. Thanks so much for letting us be a part of your day. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Number five, the Pool of Bethesda. Jesus performed many miracles in the Bible. Among his most famous is the miracle healing recounted in the Gospel of John. John 5, 2-9 tells the story of how Jesus Christ healed a paralytic man at the Bethesda pool. Weirdly enough, it's not the only miracle Jesus decided to perform at a pool. The Gospel of John also tells the story of Jesus healing a blind man in the Siloam pool. It likely had something to do with the fact that pools were community gathering places 2,000 years ago. If you wanted to get the latest gossip while scrubbing your back, the pool was the place to do it. It's not too surprising that Jesus chose these crowded public places to perform miracles. In 2005, archaeologists identified the Siloam Pool. It was a huge deal to uncover the physical place where one of the Bible's greatest miracles happened. One of the bigger shocks was when they figured out the pool was a mikvah. It wasn't just a local spa, it was a Jewish ritual bath. We know where the Bethesda Pool is already. It's a complex archaeological site in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. It was discovered by archaeologist Conrad Schick in the late 19th century. He found a massive massive water tank just 100 feet from the famous St. Anne's Church. Further excavations occurred in the 20th century, uncovering the remains of churches from the Byzantine era and from the days of the Crusades. It turned out Hadrian's temple contained the healing pools and had been demolished and built over by the Byzantine church. It's extremely complicated. The best way to think of it is that the Pool of Bethesda was incorporated into multiple religious buildings over about 2,000 years of history and all the ruins are intermingled with one another. We'll never know if Jesus Christ truly did heal a paralytic man here. There isn't much archaeological evidence that can prove that kind of thing. But we do know this story was taken very seriously. When the Christians took control of Jerusalem after the fall of the Roman Empire, they added chapels and churches all around the pool. It was visited by pilgrims who themselves wanted to experience the healing waters. But little did most people realize, the pool started as a mikvah. Christ was performing his miracles at Jewish baths around Jerusalem. Number 4. The Dead Sea Scrolls Secret Text During the craze to excavate every last fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1950s, researchers found something unusual. They came across a fragment without any writing on it. It was a blank piece of the puzzle, so nobody was all that interested in it. The blank fragment was donated by archaeologists to a British researcher, and that was it. At least, until now. Researchers have now used impressive new technology to unveil the script 
script that spin on the fragment this entire time. It wasn't blank, the words were just invisible. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered by accident by local Bedouins in Israel in the 1940s. The story goes that a couple of shepherds were looking for lost sheep in the desert when they shattered a piece of pottery, found a scroll fragment, and the rest is history. Twelve miles from Jerusalem in the dry and barren caves of the Qumran Desert, archaeologists and thieves descended like locusts. They picked the place apart, gathering thousands of fragments of scrolls containing the oldest known writings of the Hebrew Bible. The scrolls were created by a mysterious Jewish sect 2,000 years ago. In the early days of excavations, archaeologists often gave away fragments to collectors, museums, and people with money. Recently, Dennis Mitzi from the University of Malta and his colleagues decided to track those pieces down. They suspected some lost evidence escaped scrutiny during the chaos. They tracked down all kinds of artifacts and ultimately found the blank piece of the Dead Sea Scrolls stashed at the John Riley library, where it's been since 1997. Using multispectral imaging to pick up various wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum, the team revealed text on the fragments. There isn't very much text, nothing to cause a stir or compose an entirely new biblical book. The fragments appear to be lines of text from the Book of Ezekiel. Number 3. Tell Dan Steele in the early 1990s, archaeologists uncovered fragments of a mysterious monument built nearly 3,000 years ago. The fragments, when put together, create the Tel Dan Steel, a slab of black basalt erected by a king of Armenia in northern Israel. Although nobody knows the name of the author because it wasn't written on the monument, it was most likely King Hazael of Aram Damascus. What the monument does say in the Aramaic inscription is that Syria and Israel were at war and that the god Hadad made the author of this steel victorious over Israel. During the fighting, the inscription says that King Jeram of Israel was killed, along with his ally King Isaiah of the House of David. The inscription created great interest after it was discovered because of this one reference to the House of David. It's the earliest known confirmation in the record of the Davidic dynasty. This has been a huge boon to biblical archaeologists. The steel found at the ancient site of Tel Dan appears to confirm that certain events in the Old Testament were real historical events. The biggest difference is that in the Bible, Jehu, future king of Israel, is the one who crushed King Joram and King Ahaziah. The way archaeologists have rectified this is by suggesting King Hazael took credit for Jehu's military prowess. But the big takeaway from the discovery is the confirmation of the House of David, the line of great rulers that started with David, the man who slayed Goliath. Life. What's your favorite story from the Bible? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe. Number 2. The Sudarium of Oviedo the Sudarium of Oviedo is a blood-stained piece of cloth that dates back at least 1,300 years, according to radiocarbon dating. It can currently be found at the Cathedral of San Salvador in Oviedo, Spain. The reason the bloody piece of cloth is so important is that according to legend, it was wrapped around Jesus Christ's head in the moments after he died, as is said in John 20, 6-7. The main issue with this holy relic is that it doesn't date back far enough. It's definitely a bloody rag, but the blood seems to be from 700 AD. That was over 700 years after Jesus Christ died. However, the lab responsible for the dating did admit the result could be wrong. They said oil contamination may have resulted in late dating, but this almost felt like a way to save themselves from the religious community's scrutiny. The closest parallel here is the Shroud of Turin, the much more famous alleged burial shroud of Jesus Christ that has his face imprinted onto it. The Shroud of Turin has been a holy relic cherished by members of the Catholic Church for centuries, but it too has never been properly dated back to the death of Christ. And the truth is nobody knows where it came from. In the Gospel of John, there was said to be a face cloth present in the empty tomb after Jesus vanished. This cloth was supposedly picked up, taken away, and then stashed in a cave near Jerusalem for centuries. It was then taken from Palestine in 614 AD. The cloth traveled to Alexandria, was carried through North Africa, and arrived in Spain about two years later. It's been there ever since. Number 1. Q Source 
Most Christian scholars agree the first written gospel was Mark. However, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke have material extremely similar to what's in the Gospel of Mark. There is also some common material in Luke and Matthew that can't be found in Mark. Scholars believe that when Matthew and Luke wrote down their stories about Jesus, they copied much of what was already written in Mark. This is because they follow the same narrative outline. Sometimes the sayings are repeated word for word, but there are also snippets of information and teachings from Jesus Christ in Matthew and Luke that appear to have been inspired by a different source. This is called the Q source, and scholars say it could be a different gospel published alongside the Gospel of Mark, one that has no surviving copy. Researchers are a bit stumped. Matthew and Luke are extremely similar gospels. They both appear to have copied from the same source material. One is definitely the Gospel of Mark, however, we don't know what the second thing they copied their information from was. The best guess is that there was another gospel from which they were inspired fired, let's say. This supposed Q source has never been identified. Scholars don't know if it was a real physical text or an oral gospel passed down verbally. This brings us to the Nag Hammadi Library, a collection of mysterious texts discovered in Egypt in 1945. This is where the Gospel of Mary was found, which says Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene were married. The huge collection of early Christian texts is evidence that there were a lot of different documents circulating in early Christian communities. They had a lot more religious content to read than anyone ever realized. One of these early texts was probably the Q source, the elusive base material for the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you'd like to see a part two, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time. Bye.